turn with me to the scripture reading that we had today, and that's Hebrews, the 11th chapter, because I want to emphasize certain things. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith in the Bible. And uh, I want to focus on something that the Bible says about Abraham and others. Chapter 11 and verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Verse 9. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise. Notice an alien in the land of promise. As in a foreign land dwelling in what? Tents. Have you ever been tenting? <laughs> Abraham dwelled in tents with Isaac, Jacob, followers of the same promise. Verse 10, for he was looking for a city that had foundations. In other words, Abraham did not consider this world his home. He dwelt in tents looking for a place that was a permanent dwelling. Heaven is our home. But today I want to talk about camping. Why do people do this to themselves? Why do people go camping? Have you ever wondered about that? I've been camping many times. I remember way back. I just graduated from Hutchinson or from Maplewood Academy in Hutchinson, Minnesota. I had been a senior and now graduate. And my buddies who had also graduated went to their various places. I lived in South Dakota, one lived in North Dakota, a couple of them in Minnesota. And we decided to converge back on, on the campus for camp meeting. And I would bring the tent and so on. We'd all bring our sleeping bags. And we just wanted to go to camp meeting, you know, to see what girls might be there and kind of hang out. And uh, so we did. And it was a beautiful day on Friday when we arrived and pitched our tent. We didn't have any money. We didn't make a reservation to pitch in the right place. But the farm manager who we'd worked for said, why don't you just put it there on the, on the lawn over at the farm? So we pitched our tent, beautiful spot, nice and grassy. And uh, then we, once we got everything in our tent, unrolled our bags, the four of us, we went to hang out and see what was happening that night at camp meeting. We went back to our tent afterwards, crawled in the sack, and went to sleep. But in the middle of the night, suddenly, there was a loud crack of thunder. And we discovered that a terrible rain or uh, a terrible storm was hitting the area. In fact, believe it or not, there was a tornado that went by five miles away. And I mean, the rain started to come down like you would not believe. And uh, I, the problem was, this is back in the day where tents were made out of canvas. And this tent had been in our family for some time, and you're, pu you're supposed to treat canvas with the stuff that you spray on it. it. Makes it waterproof. It dries out. Well, I hadn't done that. And we discovered that the only thing that the tent did was filter the water so that it came through more fine than it was hitting the top. And we were getting soaked. And I mean it rained hard. The second thing we discovered was we had pitched the tent in a low area and all the water was running to that spot. And it wasn't long and then the wind began to blow and shake our tent and um, all of a sudden a stake pulled up and I jumped over there to hold that corner down. The wind was shaking and blowing another stake popped up and my buddy, he went over to another. And pretty soon we're all four sitting in the corner soaked. Sleeping bags floating, water several inches deep in the tent. It was terrible. It wasn't the way we had planned. And so when the storm was over, we all crawled out. Everything wet. We were wet. We had Sabbath clothes hanging in the middle of the tent. They were soaked. And so we went around in the dark to see what to do, and we found the conference moving van without a lock on the back door. And we got in there, and lo and behold, there were a stack of dry blankets, and we spent the rest of the night there. Camping does not always turn out the way we plan, does it? Have you ever noticed that as you think back 
at times when you went camping. I remember the first time Debbie and I went camping after we were married. Her twin sister and uh, her new husband, we'd all been married the same summer, and I think this was the next school year, the next summer. And uh, the girls were going to the university, Andrews University, and us guys were working full time to help support them. And we decided that on this particular holiday, we're all going to pack up and go camping. I had a 54 Chevy. And the girls had prepared everything, and us guys got off work a little early and came home and uh, put all the things in the car. And I mean, when we go camping, we are organized. We have a cook stove, we have lanterns, everything, sleeping bags. And we were going to Park County, Indiana. If you've ever been to Park County, you would never forget it. There are 39 covered bridges in one county. And so there's a map. You can drive to these various ones. You can still drive through many of them. And we thought that would just be an awesome thing to do on this weekend an extended weekend with a holiday is to go camping there. So we got down there, and being a holiday, we didn't realize how many people would have the same ideas. So we got to the state park, and we were lined up on the highway to get into the state park waiting in the traffic. And after waiting for about a half hour, and, and we had pictured uh, having our tent up, having worship before the sun went down, and everything nice. And here the sun was going down. We're still way back there waiting to get into the park. So we thought, you know what? There must be a better place. We didn't have these smartphones back then, but we got out a map and we found a county park. And we drove over there. By then it was dark. And uh, we found a camping spot. And we quickly got the things out of the car. Remember, I, I was so organized, I had a tarp to put down under the tent, you know, to keep the tent bottom dry. Then I put the tent out and got the stakes in the four corners. Then I went back to, to the car to get the poles. But there were none. Have you ever pitched a tent without poles? It's not easy. And there were no trees right around except there was this one little tree Someone had just planted, so we put a rope over to that, and it kind of propped one corner up about so far. We backed the car over and tied another corner to the bumper, and all four of us crawled in. It wasn't camping the way we pictured it. <laughs> Needless to say, the next day, after looking at some of the covered bridges, we went home. And I can tell you many more stories about camping. But one thing for sure about camping is that rarely do things turn out the way you plan. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember Art Linkletter. Back in the 60s, he would interview children, and he would have a class of children from the school. He had fifth graders one time. And he said to them, he said, what is it you want to be when you grow up? And one little guy raised his hand, and he said, I want to be a returned missionary. Notice the emphasis on the returned missionary. I don't want to be a missionary. I want to be a returned missionary. He'd probably gone to camp meeting and he'd seen missionaries go around dressed up in the local garb and telling all the fantastic stories. And he thought, wouldn't it be great to tell those stories? But he didn't want to do the work that came first. I, th I have come to the conclusion that people go camping so they can be returned campers and show the pictures and tell how wonderful it was when it wasn't. And so that's my conclusion. Christians, or the Christian life is much like camping, but there are four stages. In camping, there are four stages in our Christian walk. Stage one, we call it the dreaming or the planning and the hoping stage. About this time of year, some of you men can resonate with this. We tend to get out the maps. Of course, nowadays there's computers and so on. Lay them out on the floor and start thinking, where are we going to go this summer? Right? Where's our trip going to be? And as we envision this trip, we don't envision problems. All we envision is that everything's going to be fine. And this year we're going to be prepared. And this year it's going to be different. And so we prepare. We have dreams. Life is much like that. In youth, we have dreams of what life is going to be like. 
we picture ha marrying the perfect spouse. No problems, no arguments, no misunderstandings. We dream of having the perfect career. We can hardly wait to get to work. And because our marriage is perfect, we can hardly wait to get home. And we, per we, we picture raising the perfect children. They volunteer to work. They jump up in the morning. You don't even have to wake them up. And uh, they take their baths without being reminded. We picture all this. We picture the perfect house, that dream home. We picture always having enough money and not running out. But do you know that in life, one or more of our dreams crash? One or more of our dreams crash. For some people, all their dreams crash. Because life is like camping. Back when Debbie graduated from college, <clears throat> I still hadn't decided what I was going to be when I grew up. I'm not sure I have yet. But she had three calls, one to Wisconsin, one to Michigan, and one to Ontario, Canada. And she said, well, where should we go? They all look good. And I said, well, let's go to that place in Canada because it's up in the wilderness. And I can be like a pioneer. We'll get a little piece of land. I'll build a log cabin while you're teaching school. She said, oh, well, that's great. Let's do that. So we went up, and it was literally in the bush, as they call it in Canada, a little tiny tiny town, little tiny church, and they had a small church school, so they hired Debbie. And we discovered that things weren't quite the way they are in America. In Canada, it's very difficult if you own land to divide it or subdivide it. So there was no land for sale. And so we had to kind of back off from this big dream that we had. Let me clue you, I stayed busy though. We burned wood heat that winter. This is Canada north of Lake Huron, okay, it was cold. It would get, one time it got to 60 below zero, and I'm not talking about wind chill. It was often 20 to 30 degrees below. When it's that cold, there is no wind. It's just still and cold. And so every day I would need to get wood to feed the stove. And I didn't have a chainsaw. I didn't even have a splitting mall. I had a cross-cut saw, and I had an ax and borrowed my dad's pickup, because I didn't have one. And uh, we had a little girl. She was less than a year old. I'd bundle her all up. We'd get a permit for crown land cutting. And so I'd go out and size up the trees. And uh, of course, there's lots of snow. And, and I would fall a tree with my cross cut, OK? And then I would cut it all up, take the ax and limb it, and then cut it all up into pieces. And then I had this toboggan, and I would stack all the wood on the toboggan and put Amy Jo on top of the wood. Then I'd pull this back to the road and load it all in the truck, and then drive the truck back home and unload all the wood and start splitting it. By that time, Debbie was home. Do that every day. So you'd be a pioneer. I decided maybe pioneering wasn't really the way to go. But uh, big dreams. A number of years ago, after I was in the ministry, I read a book, some books you shouldn't read. This book talked about how an American can go, if they have a savings of $10,000, put it in the bank and live off the interest on Lake Chapala, Mexico. I told Debbie that's for us. So, you know, ministry is kind of stressful, and I thought this is a better opportunity here. We sold a bunch of stuff. We had just built a house. We did it with our own hands, and we put it up for sale. And everything hinged on selling our house. We even bought an old Airstream trailer, and I restored that, and we were going to pull that and go down to Mexico spend the rest of our lives. It said that you could hire some servants for a few pennies a day. I pictured being in a, you know, a very comfortable situation. Lord didn't sell our house. <laughs> so I hung in there in the ministry. Got a call to, um, well, I was serving up in Oregon for a while. Got a call to, uh, to or I was in, we were in Wisconsin. 
And I was on a leave of absence, and I told the Lord, I think I'm ready for full-time ministry. It was about a year and a half later, our house hadn't even had a looker, let alone a buyer. And so I got a call to the Oregon conference, and uh, we just, we looked, we went out there, and they showed us the churches, and we were excited about moving to Oregon, but when we interviewed in the churches, we looked at one of the churches and thought, wow, I've remodeled a lot of churches, and I thought I was done with that, but this one needs to be remodeled. So we told the conference president, well, we're going to have to pray about this a little more. You know what I mean? And we need a sign from the Lord. He said, I'll call you Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. So we went back home to Wisconsin. 10 o'clock approached, and we still hadn't, didn't have a sign from the Lord at 9 o'clock. The realtor in Indiana called us up and said, I have a buyer for your house. We hadn't had a looker, and it had been a year and a half. Now we had a buyer, full price, signed. So we went to Oregon. I could tell you many stories, but somehow the Lord did not want me to relax on Lake Chapala, or whatever you call it. I don't even know if that's the right pronunciation, but it looked good to me. So life is full of dreams. We have dreams of what is going to happen, what's going to transpire, how our family is going to go, how our career is going to go. But one or more of those dreams will crash inevitably. For some people, all the dreams crash. Second stage is reality. Real life. We get engaged in real life and those dreams don't work out the way we planned them to. I remember back in 1971, um, I just graduated from academy, living in South Dakota, as I mentioned, and my buddy and I were going to Camp Desmond Dog at Doss in Bering Springs, Michigan. It was actually the last year they held that because shortly after they went to a volunteer army and didn't need to conduct this training for medics. And so we were going all the way. I picked him up in Minnesota. We were driving all the way to Bering Springs, Michigan, go to this 10-day intensive to teach us how to be in the army and how to be medics in the army we were 18 my number was 26 and uh, the interesting thing is on Friday my father had purchased a brand new 71 Chevelle I would talked him into it of course and he hadn't done anything except drive it to church and back and Sabbath afternoon I took off in this brand new car and headed for Minnesota to pick up my buddy and off across to Iowa and on to Michigan. And so we were all excited. Here we were on our own and brand new car and we got out in the middle of Iowa and we decided it was time to stop for the night. I had brought all my camping gear. Same tent, by the way. And it said state park. So we got off the highway, we went to the state park, and we drove around a little, and there was this place where it looked like nobody was camping. There were some picnic tables, and it, it just looked nice. There were a few trees, so we thought, this is the spot. And so we unloaded all of our gear, and we dragged it back through the trees to a little clearing. And we pitched our tent, and we had supper, and uh, we decided it was time to go call our parents and say, we're okay. So we turned out the lantern in the tent and began to walk back through the trees to the parking lot where our car was. We were the only people at that particular area. And here comes a four-wheel drive, lights flashing, you know, uh, what do you call them, R park ranger. And spotlight looking around. As they pulled up toward our vehicle, they swept the area with their spotlight, and we didn't know what was going on. I said to my buddy, hit the ground, so we both flattened out, and the light went over us, and when the light went over us, we scrambled back to the tent and got in, and got in our sleep bags and tried to look innocent. Problem was, we were fully clothed. I had my glasses on. Our shoes were on. We are inside our sleep bags, and here they came, and they were gruff. What's going on here? You know this is a picnic area. This is not camping. What are you doing? Come out of that tent. So we dragged ourselves out, fully clothed. We saw your light go out when, when you saw us pull up. 
you know you're not supposed to be here. We could throw the book at you. You violated three state and federal laws. And uh, they said, uh, we, we won't throw the book at you if you get out of this uh, state park in five minutes. We give you five minutes to get out. If I'd been a homeless person, it wouldn't have been a problem, right? Uh, so they took off. We took our tent. We had all kinds of stuff in it. We pulled up the stakes, dropped the poles, and grabbed two corners and just dragged it, the whole bunch. Back to the car, opened the trunk, and stuffed it in. We couldn't put the trunk down. Things are hanging out. We took off, and we came out in six minutes. They had three vehicles there with lights flashing. You know, we were real criminals. It was worse. I mean, no, I won't go there. I was going to talk about the border. Um, anyway, so by then it was really late. And we drove into the nearest little town. And there were lights on in the town. And so we spread everything out on Main Street because there were no cars coming through that town. Folded it all up, put it back in the car, got on the freeway, and got off the next rest area and sat and slept in the car. Life is a lot like camping. Things happen. My buddy and I, another buddy and I, that same summer were up in Banff National Park in his 67 Mustang. We had my tent and everything, and of course, we're always traveling on pennies and wanting to go places and see things and do things without spending much money. So we're up there in Banff National Park, and it costs to, to pitch your tent. So we saw this place that said overflow camping. We thought that's for us, free. So we put our tent up and unloaded the car. We had to carry things back into this little area. We just got settled down. Here come the rangers, the mounted police. What are you doing here? Well, this is overflow camping. Well, it isn't overflowed yet. You know, you need to be over there. <laughs> and so we had to pack everything up. And it was too late to worry about pitching it again. And so we decided we're going to spend the night in this Mustang. Have you ever tried to sleep in a Mustang? I slept in the front, crossways. There was stuff in between the two seats. My buddy's over six feet, and he curled up in the back seat. Wasn't long, and we went home. We had so many problems on that trip. The engine even caught on fire. We had to put that out with a blanket. And uh, then the car didn't run well. And it was just, we had problems. i never forget the time that Debbie and I decided to cross the US and leave our kids with my parents and we were living in Indiana wanting to live in California for some reason see? and so we didn't have much money we had a 70 or an 84 Jetta diesel and I told Debbie we let's see how cheap we can go around the whole US up across Canada and back home see how many miles we can go okay so we slept in the in the rabbit you, know, you just open the window stick your legs out no problem except for the mosquitoes here and there. We were up on top of the Sierra Nevadas, not too many miles north of here. There are several ways across the Sierra. We've been across all of them. So we were up there, I don't know, 11,000, 9,000 feet, and we decided to drive off into the National Forest and park for the night, which we did. I didn't realize how cold it gets up there. It got below freezing, and we had a diesel. And they're hard to start in the morning. We began to be very worried because no one knew where we were. We were way up there and way away from the road. And, uh, but we got the car started. We were trying to save money by sleeping in the car. We ended up going through Yellowstone and stopping at the emergency medical center because Debbie's was in pain and I thought maybe she had a blood clot from sleeping in the car. We spent more money on that medical problem than we would have with motels every night. Life is like camping. I could tell you many other stories, but I won't. John, the 16th chapter in verse 33. John 16 and verse 33 says this. <clears throat> Jesus speaking to his disciples. He said, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. 
in the world you will have what? Tribulation or trouble. But take courage, I have overcome the world. Do you know that's a promise? Have you ever claimed that promise? I've never needed to. In the world you will have trouble. I never claimed that promise. I had plenty of it. Jesus said there would be trouble in this world, but we tend to be surprised when it happens. In this world, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer, Jesus said. Life is like camping. Be of good cheer. Stage three is longing for home. Have you ever noticed if you're out camping for a couple weeks that home looks a whole lot better? We've taken many trips from the Midwest to California. And when the kids were small, you know, we'd tell them all the things we're going to do. They used to listen to Packy, the runaway elephant, Pokey, the runaway bear, and Sally, the runaway monkey. I said, you know, those are a Fleischacker Zoo in San Francisco, or they used to be. And I said, we're going to go there, see? And so we'd take off, and they'd be all excited, and we wouldn't be out of Indiana. And they said, are we there yet? No, it's a long ways. And we'd start off across Illinois, and uh, are we there yet? This is a long trip, you know? And guess what they'd do? They'd start picking up, picking on each other in the back seat and fighting. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said concerning his second coming, he said the servants of the master who delays his coming begin to fight among one another. <laughs> we saw it happen as we went camping. So we're going off across the prairies and Debbie said, oh, look at this. We ought to stop here. This looks interesting. And I'm like, no, let's get there. You know, and uh, the kids say, oh, this looks interesting. Well, let's stop. And I'd always say, same thing. We'll do that on the way home. We'll do it on the way home. We got to get there. So we'd get there and we get tired of camping on the way home. Guess what? Nobody wanted to do anything. All we want to do is go home. A clean shower, a soft bed, let's go home. Life is like camping. Because through all of our trials and tribulations, our hearts turn home. Our hearts turn home. <clears throat> One time I was out in the middle of Iowa. My son and I were going from a convention in Chicago back to Oregon where we lived and uh, we were driving along making good time on I-80. You come around Des Moines and it kind of wraps around to stay in 80 you need to turn. And somehow we didn't watch the signs and we're just making great time and all of a sudden the sign said welcome to I think it was Missouri. Now, what in the world? This should be Nebraska. See, I was so disgusted with having you know, we were making such good time, and now we blew it, that I was very animated to put some miles under us. So we turned, and we went cross-country and headed toward Lincoln, Nebraska, without going all the way back to Iowa, uh, Des Moines. And I was so um, determined, which kept me awake, that we spent that night in Idaho. We went 1,125 miles in one day. We started out in Chicago and ended up in Idaho. That's a long ways. Longing to go home, thinking about home. Luke chapter 15 and verse 17. Luke 15 and verse 17. You know the story of the prodigal son, how he took his inheritance and he went to a far country, the Bible says, and there he squandered his inheritance. And it said that he, he ended up not only running out of money, but then he ran out of friends because they liked him because of his money. But he ended up feeding pigs for a Jew that was the bottom. You couldn't get lower than that. And the Bible says that he longed to eat the husks that he fed the pigs. Notice verse 17. But when he came to his what? Senses. When he came to his senses... It says, he, came, he said to himself, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? When he came to his senses, he got homesick. He suddenly decided home was the place to be. He began to smell mom's homemade bread. See, 
how many of the hired men are eating mom's homemade bread and here I am feeding wishing I could eat the pig's food and so the Bible says he got up and he went and that wasn't easy he was in a far country he was out of money he had to walk the Bible said he was naked he had given up everything it was tough he expected a bad reception when he got home he went he went home looked so much better after what he'd been through God allows many things to happen to us in this life because heaven is our home and the more that happens to us and we say why does this happen to me home looks better home looks better and our priorities change which is the last stage stage four our priorities change we begin to see things our values change the attractions lose their glitter suddenly home begins to glitter Indiana actually didn't look so bad after camping in California <laughs> but now we're glad we're here <clears throat> John 14 verse 1 to 3 Jesus said let not your heart be uh, be troubled you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms or mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare what? Place for you. God put it in the heart of us to be in a place. Wherever that place is, all of us need a place. And when we leave our place, we long to go back to our place. But our real place is heaven. God has prepared a place for us. And when he prepares that place, he thinks of each of us individually. He knows our longings. He knows what talents and gifts he's given us. He knows how, he, how he's wired us up. I know that in heaven, wherever he's preparing a place for me, there's a shop in the backyard, a place where I can work on things. Probably won't be old cars, but it'll be something. God knows each place. He knows that Debbie needs a sewing room, see. To sew those white robes or those rays of light. I don't know. Maybe you have to sew them. <laughs> but he knows each of us and he's making a place for us. Our priorities, our hearts shift home as we go through this life. Last May, Debbie and I went to Slovakia. Do you know where that is? You, uh, it used to be Czechoslovakia, now there's the Czech Republic and there's Slovakia. What, happened, what started the whole thing was my buddy and I were down in Uganda, Africa, doing uh, some work down there. And I said, you know, Debbie says that, Debbie complains because I go to all these places, Israel, Peru, wherever, without her. And we're doing all these things, and uh, as valuable as they are, she, she has to stay home, can't afford it. He said, take her to Slovakia. He said, it's really cheap, it's clean, and the people are friendly. I said, okay. So I went on my smartphone in Africa, and I Googled, you know, a trip from, a flight from Portland, Oregon, to Vienna, Austria, which is right next to Slovakia. And I couldn't believe what I came up with. $350 a ticket. I told him, he said, that's impossible. I said, it's right here. And he said, well, get it. There must be something wrong, but get it. So I got it. And I called Debbie, smartphone, and uh, I said, guess what? I'm going to take you to Slovakia. And you, the paperwork, I put your email, it'll all come, and da da da. So it came, and she read the fine print. And you know how when you type in airports, you start typing, and then it drops down a box, and, you know, here's where your pocket. So you don't have to finish typing. I thought we were going from Portland, Oregon. We were going from a place with almost the same name in Finland to Austria. So I said, oh, you got to call them. They were cheap old flights. And I said, you have to tell them this is a mistake. So she did, and she called me back and said they can't do anything about it. It's irreversible. So I said, well, Debbie, you have a way, you know, with words, and call them and tell them, can we transfer it? And so they allowed us to do that with a little penalty. So I went online again. I, sure enough, I found a couple tickets for only 700 each, which was still a pretty good deal to go all the way to Austria. 
So, even though we didn't have that much money, we were booked to go to Austria last May. And then I thought, you know, two weeks in Austria, what are we going to do? Where are we going to stay? We better rent a car. So I went online and, wow, that looks expensive. Found a car in Bratislava, Slovakia, for $11 a day. We can do that. We sleep in the car, we'll be fine. It won't cost much, see? So you've heard stories of when we were young. This is last year. So we took two rolling suitcases. Mine had sleeping bags in it, and hers had pillows. We got this little hatchback. I made sure it was a hatchback. And as soon as we rented it, we put the back seat down, rolled out our sleeping bags, and we're on the road. You know, Couldn't stretch out. It was a little bit of a problem. After two weeks of that, we were looking forward to going home. Going home. And uh, But it was a good trip. We, we got tired of Slovakia, and then we went up into Poland, Auschwitz, Czech Republic, Germany, Austria, Italy, Slovenia, Hungary, and Ukraine. You have to pack it in if you, you know, make it worth the trip. Life is like camping. Our hearts turn to home. Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans, chapter 5. Debbie always tells me the reason I married you is because no one else is willing to live with you. <laughs> She's probably right. Romans 5, verses 3 through 8. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Those are camping experiences. Knowing that tribulation brings about what? Perseverance. And perseverance, proven character... And proven character, what's the last one? Hope. Just as we were talking about, these tribulations do something to us. They build character, but also they put hope in our hearts for home. And heaven is our home. Someday I'll have my dad preach one of his favorite sermons that's homeward bound. You've got to hear that one. And uh, someday we'll have him preach that. Thank God for camping. Let's close by singing a song. And uh, I'm a pilgrim, and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a while. Number 400, oh, I'm not done preaching. I almost forgot, didn't write it in my notes. I'm going to ask my wife to come up here. Back when our daughter, who's now 40 what, something, was 14, she went away to academy. And uh, she grew up a lot in like two months. And all of her perspective changed as she was away from home. And I often read this or try to read it. And you know me, I'm just, uh, uh, Debbie's got emotion of steel. See, So she'll read this to you. Our daughter wrote this. It's an essay, right?
relationships we have with family, friends, husband or wife, and the ultimate God. The simple, everyday joys we receive when we are with them. The things we often overlook because we are too busy looking for greater happiness. When will we learn to enjoy the simple things in life? The times we spend with each other, the precious moments that can bring us the only true happiness this world has to offer. This is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and God is the sun that the rainbow reflects. When we are old and looking back over our lives, we won't say, if only I had had more money, or if only I had lived in a bigger house and wore more expensive clothes, or if only I had been more beautiful. Nope. Instead, we will remember those special times, playing ball with little brother, a shopping day with mom, a bike ride with dad, and days spent with friends. These will be worth more than anything, and the only regret we, we will have will be, why didn't I realize it was true happiness? Why did I always strive for success and I was doing and all I was doing was trying to win a losing game. So why not stop chasing rainbows, stop running the rat race, and enjoy what little time we have on earth with something we can take with us, each other. Good job. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, let's take our hymnals and turn to number 444. 444, I'm a pilgrim. Let's all stand as we sing. I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. Do not detain me for I am going to the fountain. I'm a pilgrim, and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. There the glory is ever shining. Oh, my longing heart, my longing heart is there. Here in this country so dark and dreary, Long to wander, forlorn and weary. I'm a pilgrim, and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. There's the city to which I journey. My Redeemer, my Redeemer is its light. There's no sorrow, nor any sighing, any tears there, nor any dying. I'm a pilgrim, and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have a better place for us and that you give us hope that fills our hearts so that we can endure to the end. I pray for each person here. May we recognize, may we not get discouraged by the troubles and tribulations in this life, but may it just build our hope and our longings for heaven, our real home. In Jesus' name, amen.